You need to embrace capitalism. It is this hope which is the lever of progress. My favorite Fed. To keep one's reactions warm and true. They attack us because we're over there. Is to have found the secret of perpetual youth. Man, you're too pretty to be a libertarian. And perpetual youth <laughs> is salvation. What's up, you kooks? You're listening to a boy named Sue. That's Mr. Sue to you, and welcome to the show. I invited Vinermani back on because I'm loving this crypto stuff, man. So I had him on to basically give us the how-to when it comes to getting ready to really live this life of crypto. What kind of wallets to buy, where to buy, how to keep it private and on the down low away from the state. And we go off on a tangent on some other stuff, too. So it was just a great conversation. I think it's going to be really helpful for the new people that are getting into it. And also, it's just a nice reminder for people that are already super nerdy on all of this, you know, crypto blockchain stuff. So, Vin, as always, thank you so much for your time, for coming on the show, for educating me more on crypto I really enjoyed it, and I really hope that you guys enjoy it as well. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Vin Armani. Enjoy. Vin Armani, good afternoon, sir. What's up? How are you doing? I'm doing all right, man. Just live the dream. But I'm super stoked to have you on again, so thank you so much for your time. I kind of want this to be kind of a uh, Crypto for Dummies how-to 101, and if it is possible to answer how one can completely live off cryptocurrency because okay. yeah because <laughs> okay. we, we got technologies like bitpay and um that seems like it's making a reality to to do so so i just want to cover how you can completely kind of stay off the state's radar avoid your data being seen from the irs so that would be avoiding certain big companies and i kind of want to go over you know wallets you know, which ones you should buy, what kinds there are, what options are, uh, where not to buy crypto, and how to avoid uh, companies that go through, you know, KYC standards. And um, yeah, maybe even like escrow if you need an escrow, just, you know, the the 101 on how to do crypto. Okay, yeah. So let's see, where should we where should we start? Well, I well, I'll I'll just start with my own background. So why should I why am I even qualified to be having this conversation? Um I you're have, the crypto savage. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I bought my first Bitcoin in twenty twelve and at the time I was in an all cash business and making a significant amount of money in an all cash business. And so I started to learn things that I could do with cash. I was living in Las Vegas, which is a, a very cash-friendly town. So that made things easy for me. Um, obviously, with all the gambling and everything, there are a lot of people that deal in cash. And with the servers and bartenders and strippers and escorts and you name it, right? So there's a lot of cash flowing around that town. So most people accept cash. Uh, but also things like um, anonymous private vaults. So I was keeping, you know, my my cash there, uh, learning how to really have a good safe, all of these things. And I came across Bitcoin. I think I had heard of it maybe in 2010, uh, maybe probably 20, closer to 2011. And then I, you know, had this cash and I was like, well, maybe this might be something good to look at again. At that time, there was not that much that you could actually do with it. And certainly the capability to earn Bitcoin in 2012 was was very uh, little. Um, so fast forward, you know, I started working on it in, in uh, 2014, developing, and then fast forward to, I guess, probably 2016, when I started my podcast, I was like, this is something that I had really liked. Um, things were a little strange at the time, because uh, BTC uh, the fees were were quite high, and so I was into exploring other crypto and seeing, okay, well, what could be done, and to share that with people. And it was through the show, um, writing a, writing my second book, 
I moved my vodka over, selling T-shirts, that I started to accept cryptocurrency. And then my income progressively became less fiat and more crypto over time. And so now I'm in a situation where most, uh, if not all of my income in any given month is coming in in the form of cryptocurrency, mostly uh, Bitcoin Cash, but but others as well, because like I have my newsletter counter markets, most of our sales uh, per month for our subscriptions are coming in in cryptocurrency. And it's usually four different ones, four or five. We I accept dozens, but it generally seems to be Bitcoin BTC, Bitcoin Cash, Dash, and Litecoin seem to be the four cryptocurrencies that people are actually using in commerce. And uh, when I was living in New Hampshire, which I did for a year, that also seemed to be the case. Uh, it's used vi- a lot for commerce uh, amongst the free staters and the free state project in particular. So there'll be Liberty markets on a weekly basis where you go kind of something like a farmer's market kind of. And, and so, you know, everything from local farmers to people selling cider to crafts or whatever. If you go to pork fest, same sort of situation, you can usually pay in crypto. So I've had uh, now years of experience in both earning cryptocurrency and then trying to figure out how to just go end to end, because that's really, I think what you want to do from uh, if, if what you're looking to do is to have more liberty, uh, if what you're looking to do is to um, free your life up from the state, then I do think that the biggest move that you can make, and it's not just activism. I'm not somebody to go out in the streets with a, a banner and go and protest, but this is the type of real individual revolution that just by you making the difference in the way that you organize your financial life, you really do free yourself up significantly from the state to the point where a lot of the things that people gripe about, like taxation is theft, well, you can just stop being stolen from. You really, really can. And especially now, things will probably change in the future uh, in terms of the state going, having more technology to actually... uh, take and confiscate some your cryptocurrency. I don't know how long it's going to be before that happens. But at the moment now, if you're doing things right and you have a, a, even a minimal level of oper- operational security, it's uh, you're pretty much off the radar, even from uh, the U.S. government. So maybe that's what we can do is we can go into uh, what that looks like end to end if somebody wanted to start walking down that path and sort of the tools that I've learned over that time. So I'll start at whatever point you want to start. Well, I would kind of naturally think you would need to start with getting a wallet, right? Picking and choosing because you need, you need crypto, but you need somewhere to put it first. But then that kind of goes hand in hand. Like, well, where do I buy it? And I don't want to buy it from a place where any fed can just take it and audit me. And so I don't know. You're the expert here, so where's the best place to start? If someone wants to get into crypto, what do they need to get first, and how do they get it? Well, okay, so you will definitely need to have a wallet. And so when we're talking about wallets, let's be sort of clear as to what we're talking about here. Um, your your crypto, since this is like a 101, let's, let's start with Bitcoin because that was the first. Uh, the rest of them are going to be very similar. They all sort of were born out of this essential concept. What you're dealing with is you're dealing with a decentralized ledger. So imagine, and and, and this is a, a very sort of scaled down explanation, uh, but it will suffice for someone who's just starting out. Imagine it's like your bank ledger, but every single person uses the exact same bank. And so there aren't necessarily deposits and withdrawals. All of the money that's in the bank is in the bank. And if I want to transfer money to you, it's basically just a change in the ledger. So you imagine if you and I both use Bank of America and I want to send $20 from my account to your account, it's not like there's a withdrawal and a redeposit into a new account. It's changing an entry on a ledger for Bank of America. And now what is on deposit with them moves from my possession to your possession. So imagine that except on a global scale and decentralized to the point where Um, 
there is no bank. There is no central entity that is controlling the ledger. And so our ability to read and write on the ledger, to change balances on the ledger, is based on very well-established cryptography, public key cryptography. Some people may have heard of uh, pretty good privacy, PGP, which sort of encrypts and decrypts um, emails. It's a very, very similar technology to that. And so if you're able to uh, cryptographically prove that you own a particular balance, then you're able to spend that and assign it to somebody else who can then cryptographically prove. So what your wallet is, is it's a little... It's a little cryptography machine, basically, that is storing your private keys, which you could call that almost like your PIN code, or the best way to describe it is maybe your unlocking ability. And then your wallet will look at this ledger, the blockchain, and see, okay, with all of the different keys that I have, what is the balance in the boxes that I can unlock? And so it's not stored on your phone. You know, if you get a wallet and you get it on your phone, it's not on your phone. If you get do a desktop wallet, it's not on your desktop. Uh, the, the keys in your wallet, your private keys, it'll be backed up and sometimes represented as a 12-word a, a phrase. Whatever it is, view those as keys. And then associated with those keys are particular kind of boxes, lock boxes. And your, uh, your wallet is able to unlock those and assign them to somebody else. So what you want first off is you want what's called a non-custodial wallet. So there's two different types of wallets out there. One of them is someone else is holding the keys and they just sort of let you uh, move around accounts when you tell them, oh, hey, I'd like to move this here or this there. But they own your keys. They control your keys. So this is more like a bank. But the promise of cryptocurrency is that you don't actually need these. You can, they say, be your own bank. Uh, so really, you don't need a bank. It's just like cash, right? It's just like your own little safes that are existing out there and that you can move them into other people's accounts. That's the promise of Bitcoin. So what you want is you want a non-custodial wallet. You'll generally know a non-custodial wallet, even if it doesn't say non-custodial, if when you start it out or at some point early on, it says, hey, you need to back up your wallet and the backup will be either a phrase or a key then you can be pretty sure that you have a non-custodial wallet so if you want a multi-coin wallet i personally use coinomi i really like it if you want to experiment with a lot of different cryptocurrencies i think they have several hundred um, if you want specific like if you want to do dash there's a good there's a dash wallet i think it's the official dash wallet if you want to do Bitcoin Cash, which is what I'm really into, and BTC, Bitcoin BTC, the Bitcoin.com wallet is a great starter wallet for people to play around with. Um, and then as you get more uh, into it, certainly if you start using BitPay, there's a BitPay wallet, and that'll be helpful if we talk about BitPay, the BitPay card. So I actually have probably, I mean, I'm a, I'm a wallet developer myself, so I have a lot of wallets on my phone. Uh, and, and including my own company, Cointext, which is an SMS-based wallet. So there's a lot of different options out there. But I would say to start out, Coinomi is one that I recommend to a lot of people starting out. Uh, it's It works very well for the basic functions of, of what you'll be doing. And it supports a lot of different currencies with a, with a pretty solid user interface and, and good updates. And it's available on both uh, iPhone and Android. So that's that's where you would start. So that's kind of the Rosetta Stone of wallets, Coinomi, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. if you're just taking in different kinds of crypto, whatever it is, BTC, BCH, I mean, you can just translate it to whatever so you mm -hmm. can actually deal with multiple people who are just strictly one currency. Or when we get to BitPay, it's basically a way to secretly protect your finances and just have it translate into fiat whenever but it's still kind of guaranteed like it's yours you don't mm -hmm. have to worry about really taxation i think is what most people are worried about but is that right when it comes to uh coinomi yeah so coinomi is a non-custodial wallet in maybe yeah let's talk about taxation and let's talk about the the basic system here so this is we're talking about us in this case um, but this is pretty true for most modern 
nations that the the state and the banking system are basically one there's they're intertwined so if you owe the u.s government money oh i put that in in quotes there if the u.s government says give us your money and uh, you for some reason don't just immediately bow down and give them the money they will just send a letter out to uh, the banking system in general and say seize this person's money right out of their account and the bankers don't even they don't even stop they don't even wait they don't contact you they'll just put a lien or put a levy they'll do it and they'll charge you a fee for doing it so that the the fact that they have that access and the fact that um that connection is there says that if you're going to interact at all within this crypto ecosystem and your on ramp is through the banks or if your on ramp is through what we were talking about like a custodial situation so something like coinbase so that's another place that people start often you run the risk of uh, or or at least you reduce the value proposition that was there with the crypto in the first place because you're leaving this paper trail in this record. So what you saw recently, if people uh, check out in the news, the IRS just sent 10,000 letters to people, including some big kind of crypto celebrities like Andreas Antonopoulos, saying, we think you owe us money. We think you have cryptocurrency and we think you owe us money. And the reason that they were able to do that was uh, about three years ago, they the IRS filed a John what's called a John Doe summons against Coinbase, which basically said, "Give us all of the information on these years of everybody who did trades on your on your platform." And Coinbase fought it for a little while, but ended up having to hand over fourteen thousand accounts with all the information, and off of that they sent the uh, the letters. So just know this is this is a. Uh, a discussion about KYC AML, which is know your customer, anti-money laundering. These are laws for exchanges and for other custodians who are holding on to funds that they have to keep these records in order for you to participate in the system. If they have those records, there's always the chance that they could be reported to the IRS. Now there's varying, you know, Coinbase keeps some very, very heavy records, but there's some others that are kind of minorly kept and are just there as like a fig leaf things like bitcoin atms that might take your phone number those are not being reported to the irs necessarily it's just that if they come knocking those things might be turned over and particularly if it's on a, on a specific account uh, if they're looking for for uh, something associated with a crime so how do you avoid that How you avoid that is first use a non-custodial wallet like we talked about. So Coinomi would be an example of that. Bitcoin.com wallet would be an example of that. Um, While you're using a non-custodial wallet, when you're going to buy, if you decide that you're going to start out by buying cryptocurrency, uh, you probably will want to go through the means that will have the littlest know your customer and anti-money laundering uh, regulation. So Coinbase would be probably the worst. We know that's the worst now because literally the IRS is sending people letters based off of uh, their Coinbase accounts. Um, there are probably international, if you want to go like with international um, exchanges, probably a little bit better. For most people, ATMs in your general vicinity, you could look on uh, uh, Coin ATM Radar is a good one. To find Bitcoin ATMs, those are some usually of those are KYC though. Some of them are, but in terms of the chances of it being reported, it's considerably less. And so, the you know I've sit, sat and talked with many of these manufacturers and also people who are who are sort of vendor service vendors, and they say, eh, we sort of have that on the front end, but to be honest with you, a lot of the data gets lost. Uh, it kind of just goes into a little thing, and eh, it's there because it has to be there. But um, you know, they they they're not really fastidious about it. Most of them, they're a lot of them are independent operators, uh, and there are still some ATMs out there that you can find that actually don't require any KYC AML. 
Uh, I've found that a lot of times these are ones that are inside things like bars or that have been there for a long time. Inside shops, um, you know, oftentimes in, in like a like a comic book shop or a clothing store or something, something like that. Those are oftentimes really good places. You'll pay a little bit of a premium, but if you can find one, that's good. Uh, there's also localbitcoins.com and there's also now local.bitcoin.com. So those are all your options of, of ways to go uh, to, to buy. I personally think that the, the smartest thing, and if people really want to get into this, that what they should be looking to do is earning crypto so that they can have that income come in in a non-custodial way with really no KYC AML. So if you're selling a product and you're taking cryptocurrency uh, in exchange for that, there's even even according to U.S. tax laws, that's not even a taxable, uh, not even a taxable event. So not no more than you you know making that doing it something and, and selling something for cash like at off Craigslist or a farmer's market or eBay or whatever it is. Um, so I really do think that that's the way to go. I mean that's the way that I've moved, and then from there, you know. The, the myriad different ways of being able to pay your bills, um, you know, get food and all of that with, with crypto. So we can get into some of those and what some of those options are as well. Yeah, totally. That, that sounds great. Wherever you think the next natural step from there is. So, okay. So let's talk a little bit about earning. If people are interested in earning, uh, you know, via, via crypto, it's, a, it's actually a really good way to get into the community. And if you have something to sell, people will people will want to buy it simply because you're selling it with cryptocurrency. That's what's interesting, that the people who have decided, hey, I'm going to accept cryptocurrency for whatever my product is, and then go into the, the community itself and say, hey, I sell this thing and I sell it for crypto. We're in a mode right now where the community is very, very supportive. And so it's like it's great marketing. So that's what I tell people first and foremost is uh, don't be done unless you don't like money. You know, you should be selling anything that you're selling. You should be accepting cryptocurrency. Um, you know, most people will, especially nowadays, there's so many more people that will like take square because you could just do it on your phone. You know, it's got the little dongle and you, you slide the card or put the chip in. Um, people take PayPal. They take Venmo. They're, this is just another app. And it, it makes things easier. But the difference between all of those is there's nobody out there who's like, oh, my God, you take Venmo. I'm so excited to use my Venmo that I'm just going to buy your product. But people really do that with cryptocurrency. Uh, I also use coinpayments.net, which is uh, no KYC, no AML. They're a payment processor. Other people use BitPay. Uh, and BitPay also has on the spending side. One of the cool things about BitPay is they've got a BitPay card, which is one of the better products, I think. I, I have one. I use it. I think it's a fantastic product. Uh, it's a Visa card that you can pretty much load instantly. You just keep some crypto, either Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash, in your, your BitPay wallet, and then you can move it onto your card. And I mean, it's literally instantly that then you can spend it on so your So with card. that, there's a, uh, you, you have your BitPay card, which, like you said, is a Visa, mm -hmm. but then... You with BitPay comes a BitPay wallet in addition to whatever wallet you already have. Say it's Coinomi, or is it just optional? Well, you have to have your a BitPay wallet to load your BitPay card. But even if you don't have a BitPay card, you can just use the BitPay wallet. And it actually is. It's a pretty good wallet. It used to be called Copay, but now they just moved it to BitPay. Um, it's got Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. And uh, it works with uh, BitPay to buy things online, which BitPay is probably the biggest payment processor for cryptocurrency online. So uh, if you're buying things online, gift.com, which is gift cards, which is probably one of the, the, the better things to, you can buy Amazon gift cards, Whole Foods gift cards, Starbucks, whatever. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good way of spending cryptocurrency with no KYC, no AML. Um, so that particular wallet works very, very well with their own platform, but it also happens to be non-custodial, which is good. So you keep your own keys. They don't have your keys, and it allows you to do some pretty cool stuff like um, multi-signature wallets, 
which is if you have a, you can then share wallets with somebody else. So you and I could have a wallet together, or there could be three people, and we could only spend out of it if two of us agreed to it. So it's kind of cool if you have a little uh, partnership kind of business that you're doing with uh, with one or two or three or four other people, and you want to use one sort of code to buy and sell things with. Let's say you're doing like a farmer's market, and then at the end you can all see how much money is in there, but you can't spend it without the other people okaying it. So that's that's actually really, really cool to be able to do uh, multi-signature wallets. And so the BitPay wallet has that. So if people just want to do Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, the BitPay wallet is actually a pretty good choice for that. It's non-custodial. It'll allow you to have the BitPay card. Um, you can buy Amazon gift cards right actually literally in the app, which is cool. Um, and you can load your card so, you know, you you could conceivably do a lot of with just that app and earning Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash, you could do a lot of your uh, transactions that you would need to do just through that. So, um, so yeah, I mean, between gift cards, BitPay, a growing number of merchants who uh, who accept cryptocurrency, uh, Marco, I think Marco Coino dot bitcoin.com is a good one and that's uh that'll show you uh lists of merchants so finding merchants um that's uh that's a way to go but but like i say my most of my monthly income is in cryptocurrency right now and you know with with very little friction now i am able to to basically do everything that i need to do so it's really an alternative to a bank of course you're going to have like the minimum balance that you need in your checking account or whatever but mm -hmm. really you can just go about your day-to-day -day life like i have my money it's safe it's protected in my bit pay wallet or whatever and no one has to know about it and all the crypto that i'm gonna have as the majority of my income monthly it's going to go my bit pay. And when I need fiat, I can just make that easy transfer. Yeah, it's if it never touches a bank. So you imagine if it never touches the banking network, you really don't at this point, this particular point, have to worry too much about the IRS. So the IRS is getting, you know, uh, the your uh, W-2 and it's getting t or a 1099. And that's really where it's pulling the information in terms of uh, what you what you owe them. Uh, and in other Western countries, it's even they, they have a pay as you earn. So that's literally it's out of your paycheck before you even receive it. Right. Uh, all of your taxes are out of your paycheck before you even receive it. That's very popular in like Scandinavia. And so this is this is an alternative to that. It does not touch the banking system. Uh, at the moment, they do not the, they have not invested the technology um, in, to be able to track individuals. Um, and the more of us that are doing this, the more difficult it's going to be for them to even for them to ever do that. So that's really the thing in terms of activism is for everybody to be earning with cryptocurrency uh, because, if, if you do it right, if you use a good wallet that doesn't reuse addresses, uh, and now as for people who are getting more and more advanced in, in there's things like uh, shuffling your coins around, we won't get, that's not a one-on-one, but this is something to get, uh, you know, for people to understand that there are also things like privacy coins, which, uh, which anonymize you much more. So there really is the opportunity here to, uh, to, not have to sacrifice too very much in order and but still to be able to um, keep all of your income and to do it in a way that is completely below the radar. So um, so yeah, it just it just requires, I think at this point people who want to do it and for those people who are a little more like libertarian inclined, for people who really believe that taxation is theft, you know, it's, you can't have freedom if you don't have financial freedom. And as we've seen with, you know, these these YouTubers and other content creators, you know, the Alex Joneses of the world who uh, have been kicked off or demonetized for years. Everybody's been uh, Bitcoiners have been saying, look, if you're using Bitcoin, this wouldn't even be an issue like they could not 
take away your Patreon account. They could not uh, take your PayPal down. They couldn't do any of, the, of these things. It just wouldn't even be an option for them. And so as we see this coming along, as we see them moving to try to move to a cashless society, which is a, a more of a surveillance state, now is the time to really start, even if it's a little side hustle or whatever, to start uh, earning and spending in crypto. And then uh, you'll be ready for whether things whether things go sideways or whether this is just the next revolution. And either way, you're uh, you're on top of well, it. Well, when you say they couldn't prevent, uh, or or when you say that demonetizing or getting demonetized wouldn't work, what that essentially means, like yeah, they would still do it. But if you had that option to accept crypto, then you could just yell out to your fans, "Hey, start paying me this way." So when I get demonetized, it won't matter. Because it's not like you can like prevent the yeah. powers that be from demonetizing you because that's inevitable. Sure. Sure. I mean, if really it's a the, the why of Bitcoin. And this is, you know, you don't need to go and read the technical part of the white paper. But I would definitely suggest that people who want who are thinking about getting involved in cryptocurrency at least take and it, it'll literally take you 10 minutes if that and just read the first page of the white paper which is uh, the bitcoin white paper bitcoin a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system and the first page is not particularly technical it's just the abstract and the introduction and he's he by he i'm talking about bitcoin's inventor satoshi nakamoto is laying out the reason why Bitcoin matters, why he created Bitcoin. And the reason is all about disintermediation, which is meaning taking out the middleman. Because the middleman is where all of the power lies. So it's like the, the Rothschild motto uh, of give us control of the money supply and we care not who makes the laws. And it's very true that that middleman, if you can cut off the supply of money or increase the supply, like we see that that's really the masters of the universe. That's really who controls everything. So it doesn't matter how much money you have in your bank account if it's in your bank account, like if it can be seized. And bank accounts are seized all the time, all the time. Or if, you know, your transfers to you can be censored in, in one way or another. And so Bitcoin is really, it's, it's an anti-censorship. It's censorship resistant, but it's an anti-censorship tool. A lot of people don't think that um, communication of financial value is, uh, you know, when that's taken away that that's censorship, but it really is. Preventing you from, from doing business, preventing you from buying and selling is a form of censorship. Uh, because what you're exchanging is this value information, whether you're exchanging money or, or labor or whatever it is. And so, you know, preventing you from, from making financial transactions, that censorship is what Bitcoin is there to prevent from, uh, from happening. For you to be able to take control and say, no, I want to have a financial relationship with this person. There's no middleman involved, so whether or not you like it, I'm going to do it. And that's that's brand new. It really, really is brand new. Um, you know, perhaps we could say that that could be done in a time of like gold coins and things like that, or maybe that can be done with cash, but that still requires like you to be in the physical place with the person, so they can always prevent that. But this is across borders. You know, it, it eliminates that. Uh, it eliminates the idea of national origin, goes beyond language. If you got access to the Internet, and in some cases, even if you don't, boom, here you can you can deal with this. So it, it it is if you move, it's not just saying, well, you could you could support me with this cryptocurrency, but to, really to move to, hey, I'm deciding that I'm going to go this route. I'm deciding that. I'm going to, in all of my financial transactions, as much as possible, I'm going to take sovereignty. That's when you just stop caring. That's when, that's when it does, that's why, why do I care if YouTube demonetizes me? That's when, why do I care if this person wants to, to take my PayPal account away or take my bank account? Okay, take my bank account away. All right, whatever. Or go, you know, go levy it. Go levy my bank account. Oh, there's nothing in there. Okay, well, enjoy yourself. 
And that's that's the place that we can get to. And it doesn't require, you know, some sort of violent uprising. You don't have to be out in the streets. You don't have to, you know, prove anybody right or wrong. You just make that individual, uh, take that step as an individual. And it's an individual revolution in that way. I think the hardest part is getting people to actually adopt to it. And the more people that you can tell, the better. But whether or not they're going to adopt and take the time to educate themselves and actually pay you in crypto so you can have more money to protect i think that's really the biggest hurdle so how do you think the best way to you know let people know i mean probably what you're doing is like one step and hopefully you know more people get as passionate about this but i mean what's the best way to really like spread the word and make people do their homework this is your friendly reminder to rate subscribe if you Say the best things, they come in threes Like rate, subscribe, if you If you rate it five stars, we can raise a bar Subscribe so you can stay in tune And don't forget at the very end To leave a nice review Something like I love you, Sue Rate, subscribe, review, please Thank you. There was a time when, and and it's weird because this kind of meme has still stuck around, and I think that it's it's kind of pathological. But you know, when I first started in in Bitcoin, I mean, I bought my first Bitcoin and it was fifteen bucks, and then it went to like nine, ten months later, it went to a thousand dollars, and I was like, oh, it just like cashed out everything that I had. Like, whoa, this is crazy. And there have been several of those cycles, and people have gotten rich. Uh, you know, from making a good decision about something. Really, was it a good decision? I don't know. It was just kind of an interesting bet. For me, that's really what it was. I just wanted to learn more about this thing that I thought was cool. I had no thought that it was going to go, that it was going to go, you know, moon on me. And I think that unfortunately, that meme is still there. But it's not going to, I want to let everybody know that's, that it's done. Like that, that time in this thing is over but that doesn't mean that the opportunities are over like this is still the early 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 days and so um one of the things that i real quick you're talking more like yes please for lack of a better word not to like scare people but like a boom bust ish cycle uh and people are basically just hobbling it or playing bitcoin like the stock market and that's of course people that aren't actually going to take the time to learn if they do learn they'll probably just learn how to buy and trade it and play it like the stock market but those aren't the same people that are gonna maybe be your fans and support you through crypto well look i want people to get rich uh oh no this. like i'm totally there and, too yeah and, right <laughs> i like money and and right and and if for nothing else then Look, it would be great to be able to live comfortably. Forget about being rich, right? I would love everybody to get rich. But even to just live comfortably and be able to call your own shots outside of the purview of the state, I think for a lot of people is very attractive. And especially especially for people who are young and maybe don't have a family and are just starting out or people who are entrepreneurially minded, like this is the space to be in if you want to sort of strike out and make your own way. Like, this is the Wild West. And and in many ways, like the way that the Wild West was, it was like, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of is still a dusty town with, you know, dirt streets and there's horses and there's maybe some gunslingers around and sometimes the town falls apart and it just goes into a ghost town. And like, that's still the place that it is. But the people who had some uh, sense of adventure, went out west. Those are the people when you drive through uh, Arizona or Los Angeles or Las Vegas, those are the people whose names are on the streets or who the towns or the the family names that the towns are are named after. Uh, This is the time to be doing that. It's no lo- it's not, you know, the the prospector going out into the gold rush, but it's like, hey, this is cool. There's business to be done here. And I would love to see people, you know, 
saying, well, what, what could I be doing? What I say about Bitcoin and how people will find this and get involved is the best time to buy Bitcoin is when there is something for sale that can only be purchased with Bitcoin. And those times are coming. Like within the next two to three years, you're going to see all kinds of new business models that uh, you just couldn't do with fiat currency, that you can only do with Bitcoin because of the particular technology that Bitcoin is. That We're only 10 years in. It, it took that long to get people involved and to get people doing development. But now is the time that literally anybody that wants to be involved in this thing happening, if you love it, if you're interested in it, there is actually a lot of space, even if you're not a technical person, for people who are kind of on the communication side, on the sales side. So you mean like to be employed, like in the blockchain crypto space? If you would like to be, if you would like to be, absolutely. Or just to, you know, start your own little small business. Like this is the time anyone can be in it. Like, does that mean you can have this thing, but only if you pay through crypto? Mm. Or does that also mean that like, if you want to be in the space, there's opportunity, but you have to learn to code to get in. Because I think both is, is great. Like, I'm, I'm open to do both. And then if that third avenue to bring your skills, whether it's sales, communications, whatever, and invest those in the space, too, I'm open to that. But if you can just kind of, like, address all three of those Sure, points. sure. So, um, at, at, the, at this very moment, we are not, I don't think, at the place yet but we will be very very soon where those products and services that are only available with cryptocurrency are making people move into the space i think that probably the first things that that's going to be is i think it will probably be around gaming of one sort of or the other either gambling sort of wagering side or like literally people playing video games and the in-game currency is cryptocurrency because that's one of the things that you can actually do with crypto because, I mean, it's magic internet money already. It's Twitch just, already did a great job with the the, the bits and they're all different colors and stuff. Like, I, I love yes. that. And I think that's yes. like the best way to really get people into just because like they're shiny. Like I picture myself as a pack rat and that just like really like drags me to like, oh, look at the different shapes and colors. But uh, I, I don't yes. so Continue. <laughs> So, so, so right there, I mean, this is an example of like, that's a proto version. In so that you case, imagine, would, that, would that be right. a ton of, of tokens? Yes. And that would be so, backed by a certain crypto? It could, it could be, or you could have a token that comes out, you could have a token that comes out that just finds its own value. So for instance, there's this SLP token that's called the SPICE token that people were kind of just using for tipping as kind of like a, a meme thing, you know, in Telegram groups and whatnot. And then a few little small exchanges decided that, that yeah, you know what? If you've got 500,000 spice, we'll trade you for one BCH. And so it kind of got a an exchange rate. And now you can actually go on CoinEx, which is an exchange, and you can set, buy and sell spice tokens. And there were people who just from sort of their, doing their memes and things on Telegram, the same way that you're talking about like Twitch, that uh, and there's actually some some people who are there. There are some tipper bots out there that allow you to do things via Twitch as well. Um, that people are actually like, oh my god, I've got like thousands of dollars. Over just past several months, I earned thousands of dollars because people were tipping me with this thing that they thought was worth nothing. So this is that's why I say that I think it's this gamification and I think that it's this this tokenization that is when we're going to we're gonna to start to see this emerge a lot more. And so Twitch is an example. I don't think you're alone in the fact that people sort of like collecting these things. And that's how Bitcoin started too. There was just a demand. You know, the first Bitcoin purchase that we know of was in 2010, and it was 10,000 Bitcoins for two pizzas. And so, you know, with Bitcoin at somewhere around 10,000 now, that's uh, that's what? Ten, uh, hundred million dollars, right? Thousand, thousand, yeah, hundred million dollars. So that that translates to a hundred million dollars in, in today's price of Bitcoin for two pizzas. So that's just to, to show like that's how these things move. Um, so, so I think that that's where the, the first thing is going to be. You know, to your second point, is this a, a, an opportunity to learn to code? I would say, uh, particularly in the Bitcoin Cash community, which, is, which I'm a part of, but also Ethereum as well, this is a great reason to, 
to learn to code and to teach yourself how to code because the tools that are out there are at a pretty, they've gotten to a pretty basic level. When I started developing you in 2014, you had damn well better be a professional developer. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to create um, even a single Bitcoin transaction. Now you have things like uh, like Web3 on, on ETH, but you, on uh, Ethereum, but on Bitcoin Cash, you have like Bitbox. Great place to start. Uh, my own coding class is Code From Go. I'm reworking the curriculum with the creator of Bitbox, Gabriel Cardona, because it's such a great sort of introductory space. And it's really helpful, I think, when you're learning to code. It was for me, I'm self-taught, that what it is that you're you're sort of working on as you learn to code is something that you're really passionate about and really interested in. And what I will tell you is that right now, anyone who can, who has a, a, even a basic mastery of the ability to kind of build a wallet, knows how Bitcoin works, and the only way that you could do that is, is by working with it, you will be employed in the industry, like period. And if you're excited about it, and particularly if you're ideologically aligned with it, you will be employed in the industry. So there's that opportunity. Or you can you know, have your own business, come up with your own business, and there's funding out there. There's a limited time for that as well. So that was, you know, that was true back in sort of, I'm, I'm 41 when I was in my late teens, early 20s. That was true of, of web development. It was like, if you could create a web page and you could do web design, you would be employed. Um, and so this is another opportunity that's like that too. There's not a lot of competition in that space. Um, and then just in terms of uh, people who want to be involved in as evangelists or in the communication side or whatever sort of skill that you have, businesses are growing more and more. This is becoming a real industry. And uh, I think pretty much everybody that really wants to be involved in this and who's willing to spend some time getting involved in the community, the opportunities are out there. I mean, people are definitely definitely making money and it's a cool community of people to be in. Uh, it, it is really cutting edge and it's not sort of stayed in any way. And there are most companies, if not all, are at least uh, willing to pay you some percentage of your your salary or income in cryptocurrency, if not all. Some of them, they only pay in cryptocurrency. So uh, like Bitcoin.com is one of those, Purse.io is another one. So those, those opportunities are out there, and then you're, boom, you're sitting in the catbird seat in that way. So yeah, it's a really interesting time, and uh, f- particularly if you, to learn to code, I think it's a really great opportunity to do that. So what is the... Um really the learning curve when it comes to learning how to code. I was talking to someone who actually did take your class. So this coding is basically like you're you're typing in the certain commands, functions, and keys for, I mean, you're making a program, you're telling some sort of like widget or tool to do yes. something on a blockchain or like what is like the main reason that you're coding to make crypto possible like why do people do it and what are the capabilities what are people potentially going to start coding for for crypto or blockchain so the first thing that you would want to do or that it enables you to do is it enables you to send and receive cryptocurrency without going through anybody else's wallet that's the first thing so it's just the the guts that would be inside of a wallet that you were building. It that it would enable you to have that amount of freedom. So that's the first thing. So you build your own wallet. That's basically? right. That's right. Okay. So you would be able to create your own private keys on the fly. So you could make as many private keys as you wanted of as many addresses. You could give people those addresses. They could send it to you. You could then look and see what the balance of those addresses is. And then if you wanted to send it on to somebody, you could send it on to to them. And you could, you could basically reconstruct that if you needed to. You could do that within a few minutes on any computer that you had access to. And then once you have the code, you can basically copy and paste and do it again and make like tweaks to it. And then you can that's probably right. just make your own like wallet business. That's right. And that's actually what most developers end up doing. I mean, that was kind of my progression. My first progression was uh, that there was this, a library called Libbit, Lib Bitcoin in 2014 that I was like, how do you do this? Like I had a wallet. I had the blockchain.info wallet. But I was like, how do you how do you do this? How, how could I just do it myself? And so then I learned 
how that worked and the transaction structure. Uh, and mind you, it was much harder now. The tools now make it so much easier to do. Uh, it's almost turnkey in, in, with, with some of the tools. Um, and then, yeah, you could just decide, oh, you know what would be cool? What would be cool is if, like, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a thing where I've got, like, a little, uh, you know, a, a little Arduino or something, and I'm going to pay to an address. And when I pay to this address, like, the lights turn on in my house, or like this drone flies, or a door opens, or the, the, my my uh, sprinklers turn on at the house, or whatever it is, you know, you can start letting your mind just sort of roam and say, well, what could, what could I start doing with this? Um, so it could be a wallet business, it could be a point of sale applications. There's so many different things that people could be doing, and it really you can make your smart house crypto. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You, you, you absolutely, yeah, you absolutely could. It's, it's, uh, that's, that's really the promise I think. And as we start to see this internet of things happening, this is like a native currency for the internet and it's getting more and more so. So, you know, we're going to see pretty soon Ubers that are driving around that are automated and we're going to see people, you know, renting their, um, self-driving cars and this is the type of situation where it could be like you know you order the self-driving car you get in and literally by the mile it's sending a little bitcoin transaction to pay this thing off and then it's like oh you stop sending me okay we're just gonna stop yep, door open and uh, and get out so and all of that without going through a bank without needing permission which is the most exciting thing for a young entrepreneur right if if someone did decide, hey, I'm going to learn to code and I'm going to do this. It's like, yeah, you start up your business and you don't need permission from a bank. You could be a financial services company from the jump and you don't need to be in, in bed with Goldman Sachs and you don't need to have all of the, the, you know, the, the licenses and all of that if you do it the right way. So it's going to be a very, very productive time. It's, I was part of, as I said, like part of the tech boom uh, in uh, late 90s, early 2000s, really, really late 90s. And it was like that. It was kind of just unregulated. What kind of business do you want to do? And this is an opportunity and it's it's happening again now. So now would be the time if people want to be involved. That's who's that's who the next group of Bitcoin rich is going to be. It's going to be these entrepreneurs who, who start the next, you know, Bitcoin version of Google or Facebook or whatever. And I just want to open up a little bit more about the people that aren't tech savvy but have these i guess maybe mm -hmm. marketing sales branding skills or whatever just how can the common man bring what they have to the space it, it honestly the community is really open it's a very very open community so although we're having this talk there are tons of meetups all over the world. So somewhere near you, there's a Bitcoin meetup or Bitcoin cash. I'm particularly in the Bitcoin cash community. And as you'll learn, like the communities are a little different as you get involved in this. I think the Bitcoin cash community is a little more, a little more open and entrepreneurial, whereas the Bitcoin BTC community tends to be a little more like on the investor side that they're really interested in kind of buying and holding and the price is going to go up and and that's that sort of their thing and dash it although they, they it's a smaller community is also more into the spending aspect but go to some meetups go to conferences uh, it's it's a cool group of people watch some videos get involved online Twitter is uh, you know really vibrant in terms of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin itself is a community. Like we talked about, it's a shared ledger. So it's people who are all participating in this same sort of network as individuals. And so just getting involved in, uh, in the community and saying, hey, this is what I want to do. You'll just, being in the community, you'll see all of these opportunities come up where people are like, hey, we could really use somebody to do X, Y, Z, and we can pay. We can pay. So um, and and I think speaking of speaking of uh, X Y Z, I believe LazyFox.io. That's one that people should probably t check out. Uh, you can just do, it's like a task rabbit sort of thing. You could just do little tasks and get paid in crypto. So that's fun. Uh, so that's a cool way to just start earning and playing around in that way uh, w with it. You know, just if somebody is coming from out of nowhere. So, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of opportunities, like I said, like it's becoming a full blown industry. So whatever kind of talent that you have, whatever it is that you like to do, uh, you can certainly integrate it with 
cryptocurrency at this point. Yeah, I do like the idea of kind of digging it yourself and earning it. Like you just said, LazyFox.io, that's pretty cool. And I would also guess that you would recommend doing that instead of trading, like going on local.bitcoin.com. And I mean, if you have experience like with the stock market, I actually heard that doing that with crypto is a lot easier as far as like user friendliness. But I know that you do give some like trading courses or tutorials on that. I, if you just want to like address that and kind of any recommendations or do's and don'ts or just safety tips when it comes to that. Um, I think right now for, for me, I will just, I will, I will say myself, this is not uh, financial advice, but this is sort of my own approach to, uh, to, to that side of things. Now I, I right now with the way that the market is and the way that it's been in let's say the last two years with myself and my business, I am not taking fiat and converting it into cryptocurrency. I'm earning cryptocurrency and, you know, at times converting it into fiat because I need to, uh, you know, pay a bill or do something that I can't necessarily do with cryptocurrency. And it's been that way for me for probably, and my business, with my business as well, which my business earns its revenue in cryptocurrency as well. So, you know, we exchange that for fiat to pay bills, but we are not taking our fiat and exchanging it for cryptocurrency. So, just me personally, it's not something that I would be doing right now. I think it's too hard to time the market. A lot of people are getting wrecked at this point. We haven't seen significant appreciation um, in really in two years. If the, the price as it stands right now is about what the price was in November of 2017. I'm just kind of asking because a couple weeks ago when Chairman Powell was talking about stuff and you know people were having memes go about that trump gave the best pr for bitcoin and of course like that made it skyrocket mm. maybe someone made a quick i don't want to say buck because that would be blasphemy but you know <laughs> right. they made a a decent return in like over a weekend or something but again that's just more like the speculation side and that's not like right. the healthiest side that's what we would call short time preference i guess it's it's really, really hard to time cryptocurrency. It always has been. And I think really since, probably since 2017, um, that it has just not been a smart move to exchange your fiat for crypto. Uh, 2017, there was a crazy, crazy boom, a crazy run up. A lot of it was due to ICOs. A lot of those ended up being scams. So people both made a ton of money if they sold at the top of these weird little things that started at a cent and then went to like a dollar. Oh, my God, it went from a penny to a dollar. You know what I mean? I hundred X and then it fell down to nearly zero. But somebody bought it the dollar mark. Right. And you just don't want to be that person. You don't. And so you if you're not for somebody who's just getting started into cryptocurrency, who isn't involved in the community, who isn't able to look and see certain signals. Like at this point, with the few cryptocurrencies I'm involved in, I can, between the people that I follow on social media, the places that I know to look, the personal relationships that I have with people and the things that I know that's coming, it's it's even hard for me to time it, but I can kind of tell when, oh, 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 a big move is probably coming in one way or the other. But it's still very hard to time. So for somebody who does not have all of those resources at their disposal and they're just starting out, you may as well just take your money to Vegas. Honestly, seriously, just take your money to Vegas. Um, you're not you're not going to get uh, rich doing that. There's not going to be a 10x anytime soon. There's not going to be another you know fifteen dollars to a thousand dollars in less than a year, which was which was my first year in Bitcoin. That's what it was. Bought at 15, sold at 1,000. It was within the time span of a year. It was December to November. December 2012, $15. November 2013, uh, right before Thanksgiving, or right after Thanksgiving, I should say, $1,000. We're not going to have another one of those. People, there's a lot of what, what, what they call hopium. So there's a lot of people who are smoking on that hopium because th they remember that. Right. They remember that. And they're like, oh, I want that high. I know it's going to happen. It's not. 
that's over. We're in a completely different world at this point. Bitcoin is not novel. It's not new. It's been around. The cryptocurrency markets are established. Um, so, yeah, there's people can go out there. They can trade. I don't think that's where the money is. I don't think that's the part of the industry that's going to 10x in, in the next three, four years. So, I like I say, I want people to get wealthy. I, I would love people to get rich. Um, I'd love people to make a ton of money because if you make a ton of money, that means you've solved some problem for people. And so I would like to see people get rich, but but I doubt that anybody's going to do that from trading. Yeah, I w- would agree. I don't like taking that risk. And when it comes to just gambling, it's money that you really don't care about in the first place. As mm-hmm. as a responsible non-gambler, that's what I would say personally. <laughs> but um, before I let you go, I just want to know how you feel about the economy because i feel like we're kind of overdue for a recession and lately in the media they're like oh a 2020 crash like some people think this and some people think that this is what could cause it Mm -hmm. and i don't know if that's just kind of propaganda and slandering trump because i'm sure like the left is just you know Mm -hmm. fed up with them that's kind of beside the point if that does happen what do you think that's going to really do to uh crypto because my natural instinct is it would kind of make it go up because it's a scare or i don't know i mean just how do you how are you Mm -hmm. looking at like the world economy in general and its effects on the 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 space that's a good question i think it's hard to know and i think that there is a there is i don't know i don't know whether this is a misconception but it is a conception and there has always been a conception, and I think it's part of Bitcoin's uh, inse- inception, yes, uh, conception itself. But in the Genesis block, in the very first block in Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto put a headline. It's from January uh, 2009, and uh, the headline says it's sort of encoded. So it's encoded into the history of Bitcoin. Uh, it's actually in the literally in the Bitcoin code is this Genesis block. And uh, it says Chancellor on the brink of second bailout for banks. And so there's always been this idea with Bitcoin that um, it is some sort of a response to financial crisis. And that if there is a financial crisis, that Bitcoin will um, Bitcoin will win out in some way. And I think that this is kind of carried on from the way that people have looked at gold for a very long time, but particularly in the last, let's say, 100 years, um, and and really since we went off the gold standard, that the idea with gold bugs is always this sort of doomsday scenario. I don't quite follow all of the logic. It's kind of a little underpants gnomy for me, but it's something to the effect of um, I'm holding gold, There's a worldwide financial crash where everything falls apart and the monetary system falls apart. And somehow between that and then, you know, underpants gnomes, then all of a sudden the world goes back to using gold as currency. Right. As opposed to whatever the hell else, like uh, like, oh, yes, of course, everybody will use gold. I don't don't know. I don't think that that's self-evident. And I also don't think it's self-evident with Bitcoin. I don't really think that that's the way that this thing is going to shake out. I don't think that financial crises particularly help Bitcoin, especially because Bitcoin is so infrastructure heavy. So the difference between gold and Bitcoin is if if everybody who is just holding gold just did nothing right now, the gold would remain just as valuable. But Bitcoin requires such heavy infrastructure, the amount of electricity. I mean, it's like they say that Bitcoin mining, the amount of electricity uh, is is something to the uh, effect of like the country of Denmark or something like that. Not if they use diesel. Right. <laughs> well, I saw that article. <laughs> it's It still is, you know, whether you use diesel, whatever, it, it is to say that like in order for this Bitcoin system to keep going, It requires serious infrastructure and a financial crisis necessarily threatens that infrastructure. It threatens a lot of things. And so I do think that Bitcoin can replace the current monetary system, but I don't think that it's necessarily the case or that it's self-evident that a financial crash is helpful for Bitcoin. Just like I don't think it's helpful for any other sector of 
uh, the industry or or of any other industrial sector, right? So I, I think it's probably pretty likely that we're look, going to be looking at some financial downturn. It's been over 10 years since... Um, 2008 since the 2008 crisis it seems like these things tend to happen in these 10-year cycles um because we we had we were really had a looming one in 1999 1998 99 ravi batra uh, this uh economist wrote uh about what was this coming crash that i don't know exactly how the the worst of it was averted um Maybe, maybe because, you know, we had like September 11th that came not too soon after and, you know, you had war spending and all of this and that's very, you know, that's sort of very helpful for that. So maybe we'll have another war. Like maybe they'll, maybe it'll be war with Iran. Like maybe that's on the horizon and maybe that prevents there from being a a financial crisis. You know, war is the health of the state. So um, I, I don't think it's necessarily good for Bitcoin. I do think that we're headed for something, though. Knock on wood. <laughs> yeah, knock on wood. Seriously, Finn, where can people find you, man? Uh, at Vin Armani on Twitter is a really good place. I'm on there a lot. Uh, Cointex.io is my company, and then if people want to go back and check out my, uh, you know, content, whether that's books, podcasts, videos, whatever it is, uh, VinArmani.com is the best place to do that. It's got links to everything there. And last two things, how was the second book coming? And third, third book, third, third book. book. Oh, I missed that. I'm sorry, man. I need to get my wallet <laughs> so I can buy your books. But um, uh, what what can we expect from you, uh, future casting? And how long do you think it'll take until your next uh, learn to code course comes out? Well, yeah, I'm I'm very very busy right now uh, working on uh, Bitcoin Cash projects. There's kind of a sense of urgency for me with that, just because the you know the entrepreneur in me is like, oh my god, like here's I've got these ideas and I've got them all on my plate, and it seems like the the industry is in a place right now where they're the the things that I've been saying need to be done. There's I've gotten a lot of buy in on it, and so I'm trying to. Uh, take advantage of that social capital right now. At the same time, writing. So I, I uh, told my wife that I'm dedicated to having this book out by the end of the year. So you know, I've got what four more months uh, to uh, to make that happen. And it's maybe about a third, a th- maybe a quarter to a third done already. So I think I can probably pull it off. Uh, and then uh, Code from Go, the next class, will certainly be after that. I, I don't think that it will be before the end of the year just because I'm so busy. But I, uh, and I t- had told you this uh, before that I really am uh, dedicated to revamping it and turning the curriculum into a more crypto centric one because I do think that there are a lot of people who. Are, are passionate in the community and who, if given the opportunity to dip their toes into the water and to see that, oh, hey, this isn't that hard. This isn't like something crazy. I could actually do this, that um, every additional person is just going to make this thing happen faster. And that's really what I would like to. I'd like to see people that I can work alongside with and collaborate with. Uh, that's very much what the industry is about, and it's it's a lot of fun. So, like that's what I'm doing the class for now is is hoping that I can have some people to collaborate with in the future. This has like a hell of a New Year's resolution too. So there you go. Yes, awesome, <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I'd love I'd love to see you in the class, and so I will keep you I will keep you fully informed of it. Well, I appreciate it, man, and I appreciate you coming back on. Lots of great stuff, and uh, yeah, you heard it here first from the Crypto Savage himself. So thanks, guys. (laughs) 